I think I may have shared with this with you before, uh, but many people are not aware that Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was an advice columnist for a time for Ebony Magazine, answering questions from readers in a column series entitled Advice for Living. And there is one that I love about, you can, you can go online from the King Center and you can see some of these responses, some of these questions, but on one occasion, a reader reacting to King's frequent assertions about the power of love to transform the nation expressed his doubt about the effectiveness of turning the other cheek, uh, expressed his doubt about this notion of not fighting fire with fire, and the reader demanded to know, quote, why don't you preachers admit that love, in the highest sense of the word, is impractical in the world of today, unquote. And Dr. King responded in part, and I'm going to read just a little part of it. Dr. King said, and I quote, I am convinced that love is the most durable power in the world. It is not an expression of impractical idealism, but of practical realism. Love is an absolute necessity for the survival of our civilization. To return hate for hate does nothing but intensify the existence of evil in the universe. And this is the part that I really love, Dr. King says. Someone must have sense enough and religion enough to cut off the chain of evil and hate. And this can only be done through love, unquote. Now, I don't want to be too hard on anyone who concludes that love as a force for transforming the world is impractical. Because, quite frankly, it is. You see, the will to power in this world makes appeals to love seem futile and romantic. I suspect that many of us here find love to be an impractical answer to the many challenges the world is facing. Yes, because the world seems to always churn and turn in doing the worst and the nastiest of things. So love as an answer often feels impractical. And yet King's response is a remarkable testimony about the power of love because it comes from a civil rights leader who was at that time embarked in a titanic struggle against racism, violence, and segregation. It seemed intractable. There did not seem to be change happening quick enough or fast enough. And it comes from a, of a person who even as he answered the reader with full-throated confidence in the power of love had experienced mostly hate and vitriol and, by the way, physical violence against his person. But he found the strength to return that hate with love. And so if love seems impractical to us, it is perhaps that it just seems like it doesn't, it's not, it's not equal to the worst things that happen to us. And if, if love seems impractical, it's probably because we've been trained to believe that love is just an emotion. That's when we hear love, we think about romantic love. We think about the, 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 the love as a, as a transaction. If you love me, I'll love you back. We, we've accepted that love is, has limits. It seems also that the way we exist in the world, that we've come to believe that love is sentimentality and affinity. How I feel about someone determines how I respond to someone. And I suspect, I suspect that this is why the writer of the letter of John needed to talk to the church about love as something more than just sentimentality. 
to talk to the church about love as something that doesn't have to be fleeting. To talk to them about love as something that actually can and should make a difference in how they are going to be church. Now, we don't know exactly who wrote this letter or to which specific church it was written. But whoever the author is, he or she wrote this letter to the people of God in what they said was to make their joy complete. He or she wrote this letter because there is ample evidence that the church has a problem. And their issue was not religious oppression, which we would have expected for an early church at that time. Their problem was not financial solvency, which that probably could have been an issue simply because the church was filled with so many poor people. And their problem was not organizational disputes because, yeah, it was an organization, a fledgling organization, and, and people fight. We know that. People fight in church. If you want a good fight, go to church. <laughs> but this was not their problem. No, this church had a love problem. And let me be more specific about this love problem that the church had. Apparently, there were church folk who had become convinced of their rightness and their holiness and their faithfulness, and yet they hated their fellow church members. I'm not talking about anybody in here. There were church folk who celebrated their relationship and affiliation with God, who also feared and rejected the other children around them, the other children of God. There were church folk who testified all the time about how much they loved God. Oh, I just love God. And this so-called love of God was not reflected in their behavior towards some people. So this church had a love problem. And the author is, is going to write a letter to speak to this love issue, this, this love problem that they have. And so the author is not even writing anything new. There's nothing new in this. As I told the worship team earlier, I said, I wish I could just read the, the letter again and sit down. As some of you would appreciate that. Because the letter itself, it's a sermon. It's, it's, it's nothing new. The writer is sharing with them something that they should already know. That if they love, they live in God's light. And if they hate, they live in darkness and cannot say that they are related to God. And the author reminds them that from the beginning they have been taught that they should love one another. They know what Jesus bequeathed them as, as he was leaving his apostles. In his last words to his apostles, Jesus declared, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. And then Jesus, he turned the knife, which I love the way Jesus did it. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another. And the writer of 1 John reminds them that this love commandment, this love commandment, this commandment that Jesus makes, it's not romantic and sentimental. This is not love in word and speech. This is love in truth and action. When, when, when Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, was about to leave the disciples in the Gospel of John, his, his last final words, he said to, to Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, I love you. Feed my sheep. Not feel good about them. Not, not, not hang out, just think that they're cool and real nice and you, you're Facebook friends with them. Do you love me, Peter? Peter said, yes, Lord, you know I love you. you. You know I do. Then take care of my flock. And he asked him again, Peter, do, do you love me? 
And Peter said, Jesus, you know I do. Feed my sheep. Love, not in word and speech. Love in action. So if anyone claims to be affiliated with God, if anyone testifies how much they love God, then they should understand that God is love, love in action. God's very nature, God's very identity, God's very being is love. So if we abide in God, then we must love. This is the beauty of, of God's love. It's not fleeting. It's not transactional. It's not static. It doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't come to anybody. Even before you show up, God is love. It didn't say, God, you know, God loves you, but I know you've heard churches tell you this. I know, I know you've heard it. God love, God is love, but you are a stench in the nostrils of God. Wait, God is, it didn't say God, God, love. God is love. God's very identity, God's very being is love. So you say God is love. Oh, but God hates the Muslims. It does not compute. In the first letter of John, the writer says it does not compute. You cannot say that you love and then hate your sister or brother. And any experience, if you go from Genesis to Revelation, any experience of God, any encounter with God through the biblical wind reveals a love that is active and transformative. God is disclosed in active, I love, the letter writer said, you have not seen God. And then the obvious question, if I haven't seen God, how do I know that God is? Every time you see love, you see God. Every time love is shown, every time love is acted out, you see God. So every, in all of the biblical witness, God's love is active. You see God showing up and God's love is all about seeing someone. It's all about bearing something. It's all about enduring. It's all about sharing. It's all about giving. It's all about healing. It's all about blessing. It's all about transforming. It's all about gathering. That is active. Active. It is a love that the world now tells us is impractical. And guess what? They are right. It is impractical to love people who hate you. It, is, it doesn't make sense to share what you have without expecting anything in return. That's not how the world works. The world is about markets and exchange. It doesn't make sense to, to, to take care of somebody that you don't even know. It doesn't make sense to provide a meal to someone who, who you, can't, you can't verify is worthy of the meal you're about to give them. These things don't make sense. It doesn't make sense for, for black and white people to be sitting here on the same pew. That's not supposed to happen. It doesn't make sense that gay and straight people are supposed to be sitting in this sanctuary because we're told in the world that you are not supposed to be mixing and mingling. It's impractical to love. So the world, the world does tell the truth. But then the letter writer reminds the church that God's love was made visible in a real and tangible way. It was revealed in Jesus, sent by God to live among us. People kept saying, it's not possible to love. And then Jesus shows up and starts loving folk like he crazy. <laughs> it's impractical to love like this. And then Jesus started hanging out with prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners. 
It's not possible to love anybody like that. And Jesus started touching people with leprosy and with, with a hemorrhage. That, that's not, who is this crazy person loving like this? So when we forget, oh, it's not possible, it's impractical to love. And then Jesus shows up and starts showing us how to love. Jesus embodied a love so real and so true that Jesus would not betray us, would not deny his solidarity with us. He could have, he could have avoided that cross if he wanted to. He could, have, he, could have, he, could have, he could have pulled together a statement to suggest that, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend Rome, and I, I, I don't believe what I just told you, but he wouldn't do it. He could, have, he could have gotten off that cross, but he didn't do it. Why didn't he do it? Why didn't he save himself? Because love is active. If I say I love you, I have to embody it. If God is love, then my love has to be active. And so when they come calling and say that we're going to hang you on a cross, then I just have to die because I love them. You didn't clap on that. You missed your shout, but that's all right. The letter tells us something that we already know. God is love. We've heard that all our lives, God is love, God is love. But I know what has happened. Every time we hear it, every time someone has said God is love, they have spent the rest of their time, the rest of their words, the rest of their testimony telling us all about this God who is punitive and unloving. They, they say God is love and then they tell us all the ways that we are the worst things that ever walked and God can't love us. They say God is love and then they start rejecting us and say we have no place in God's kingdom. Oh, I've heard it. I, I know you've heard it. They say God is love and then all then start showing us all the ways that God does not love us. And then we turn around and we reinforce it. Sometimes we don't even know we're doing it. We reinforce this God. We reinforce this God by loving people who love us. And hating everybody else that we don't know or care for. We reinforce that punitive, unloving God. Every time, every time we look at someone who's different and say, oh, I can't relate. I don't know you. We, we, we reinforce that punitive God. Every time we turn around and say, well, I think they're poor because they just don't know how to act right. We, we, we reinforce that punitive God when we say, well, when, he, when they shot him, what was he doing? Why, why didn't he just behave and act right? Every time we do, it's like, oh, they should have come here legally. But, but so whatever happens to them, it's their own fault. Oh, we reinforce that punitive, unloving, mean, bad God. Every time we turn away and say, I can't love you because you're not like me. To claim God is love and then to say, to say that I am a friend of God or I am affiliated with God or I love God, it means then that we're going to have to be some impractical people. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to stand in the face of evil in this world and say I love regardless. And I know you're saying, Pastor, how can I love people who say such horrible things about me? How can I love people who don't have my best interest in heart? You can't unless you let God help you. We, we immediately say, how can I love? You can't love unless you abide in God. You can't do it. That's the, that's the, that's the crux of it. No, it, it, Martin Luther King said love, and I used to wonder, how could he love like this? And then Malcolm X said, it's irrational to love people who hate this. Malcolm wasn't wrong. It is impractical, but what Malcolm missed and what so many people missed about, about Martin Luther King is that he wasn't loving on his own steam. He was loving because he abided in God. So, you know, this love is very difficult. 
It's very difficult. It's hard to love people who've mistreated us. It is hard to love people who've hurt us. It is hard to love people who talk about us so very hard. It's hard to love the, the, the people who pick at us. It's hard to love the people who send letters to me every week telling me how much I'm going to hell because of who I am. It's hard to love, but I can do it if I abide in God. If I let God lead, if I let God have pride of place, it is not easy. It is not easy to love. But the letter writer wanted the church to know that you already know how this is done. And there are some practical ways. If you find yourself fearing someone, go to God. Because fear is the opposite of love. If you start fearing someone, you want to hurt them, you want to punish them. That's not of God. So the, the letter writer is very clear. You can't find the love you want through fear. You can't do it. You can't, if you, if you fear Muslims, you can't love them. If you fear the immigrant, you can't love them. If you fear the other, that's not a, that's not a pathway to love. And you certainly can't do it by hating. If you hate the person who's sitting next to you, that's not of God. So even in the practical sense, if you want to love someone, you can't, you've got to figure out a way to overcome the fear. We've got to figure out a way to love. People wonder, people wonder all the time how it is that we build the community we build. Everywhere I go, especially people who hear about MCC for the first time, and I say, oh, we, we have all these blended worship, and we have people from, who are former Catholics, we have people who were former Lutherans, people who were former Episcopalians, we have people who've never been to church, we have people who were former evangelical, and we all come to church every Sunday. And they say, how do you do that? It can't be because you all happen to be, you know, LGBT or Q. What, what, what is it? How do you do? I said, it's love. It's not easy. It is not easy. But we, we, we try to abide in God. And that way we can love. It is not easy to do it. People wonder how we do it. And people, people come, again, you've, I've heard people come to me and say, Pastor, how can, how can we get more people into this church? And, and that's a good question. It's, it's a wonderful question. And I, 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 I sometimes answer it, sometimes I don't. But here's what I'll tell you this. We can do every technical thing right. We can find the best programs in the world. We can, get, we can take all that money you donate us and we can build the best state-of-the-art worship space. We can do all that stuff. But if we do not love, it will not matter. If we do not love, the people will not come. It's all about love. I love, that's what they did. I didn't know they were going to sing that song. It's all about love. It really is. Impractical. Uncertain, but it's all about love. If we do not love, it won't matter. When I told my mother that I was coming to, to Minneapolis to become or try to be the pastor of all God's children, I was waiting for her to celebrate and, and be excited about me being pastor, for that was her dream for her son all her life, that I would be pastor. But I said, I'm going to be pastor. It was almost silence on the other end of the line. And I'm wondering, where, what's, the, what's this reaction I'm getting? And she says to me, and I, it plays in my mind every single day of my life, every single day of my ministry. If you don't love the people, don't do it. If you don't love, don't become a pastor. Because the missionary understood something. If you claim God, if you say I'm a friend of God, if you say I love God, if I, I hang out with God, God is my ace, God is my ride or die. If you say it, you have to love. Amen.